Welcome everyone to uh, episode one of the Stormbirds podcast. Today we're talking about IL-2 Great Battles multiplayer. The goal behind this episode is to hopefully encourage a few more people to jump in and uh, uh, try out the multiplayer scene. Uh, some, some people may be joining into multiplayer for the first time, so we thought it'd be a good idea to bring together people uh, in a group who are both experienced multiplayer community members, as well as some people who are newer to the multiplayer scene, uh, to talk through the process of getting involved in multiplayer. So uh, we hope that this episode will help encourage a few people to, uh, to maybe jump in and, and try something new with uh, IL-2 multiplayer, you know, in, in case you've been a bit worried about trying it. Uh, hopefully this will answer some questions and uh, encourage you to, to join in. So that's the goal behind this uh, episode. Uh, before I get any further, I'd like to introduce our group. Group, please introduce yourselves. Hello. So yeah, my name, my name's uh, Requiem. You might have heard my voice on YouTube at some point if you've uh, never watched anything from the uh, air combat tutorial library. Um, I'm an airline pilot and a flight instructor, and I spend a lot of time making stuff and flying around in L2 and DCS. Hey, I'm John Coughlin. Uh, online, my IL2 handle is Roger Meatball, and that's because I'm a video game developer and I make a flight sim, a casual flight sim called Roger Meatball. Hey guys, uh, Utopianer here. I'm probably the newest to uh, the multiplayer scene. I've only been in it for a couple months. Um, contributions so far are uh, Flight School Campaign on the uh, forums, um, downloaded for new players for key bindings and uh, just uh, airplane familiarization. All right, and I'm Wolfpack345. I run a YouTube channel under the same name that focuses on simulation content. And I'm pretty new to multiplayer as well. Okay, great. So, so that's our uh, group, and uh, I I thought this was a good group to uh, bring together some different perspectives, and uh, you know certainly you know, both the experienced multiplayer and the uh, the new to multiplayer scene, uh, bringing those two perspectives together through uh, talking through this. I think uh, it's going to be a good conversation. So. Uh, I wanted to get us started with uh, a question, and, and that was, uh, what are the things that you need to do before you get into multiplayer? Because I think one of the stumbling blocks that people have is uh, they're worried that they aren't ready to join in, or they don't know what they need to do to, to join in. So uh, I wanted to put that out to the group. Um, what are some of the things that you, that you need to do? Um, I don't know. Anyone want to take a stab at that one? I, I think from my perspective, the, f the first thing you'd want to do is uh, become familiar with a couple of airplanes. Uh, I don't think you want to jump into multiplayer and be learning uh, an airplane on the multiplayer server. The more you learn, the easier it is to learn a new aircraft. But uh, for me personally, I think that's, that's the best step is uh, before multiplayer, single player. Yeah, I guess the, the main thing is just be sure you know your key binds, but... Uh, I, I don't know if there's too much you need to do before you hop into multiplayer. My experience playing IL-2 was, uh, I jumped into multiplayer right away cause I didn't have a terrible interest in doing single player content and I learned the entire game via multiplayer. Um, I, I mean, certainly there, there are things that I wouldn't suggest like, um, or if you do that, be prepared to, uh, to sort of bust your planes like right as you get into the action and stuff but uh like the flight simulation runs exactly the same whether it's in single player or multiplayer so even if you spawn at a friendly airbase and just sort of fly around and and you know learn how to drop your flaps and fire your guns and stuff you can still do it in a multiplayer setting um i think maybe the thing i'd suggest more than anything is to temper your ex expectations of flying in multiplayer like um, if you, if you come in it sort of excited to, to learn what it's like to fly amongst other human pilots instead of the AI, then that might be the safest way to like, uh, manage your expectations. Yeah. I mean, if, um, sort of my perspective on like the training side of things is, you know, when you're starting out, there's a lot, it's pretty daunting, especially if you haven't done anything relating to flight sims before. So single play is a good tool just to allow you to practice with one airplane that you really like so if you find an airplane that you like you can practice with that and you know, get used to taking off flying it around just learning its kind of performance envelope and practicing a few landings um 
and you know when you feel like you're ready to start shooting at things you can practice shooting at things in the quick mission battles and uh then when you go into multiplayer you know, this is when you can hopefully have someone who can act as a mentor for you to hopefully take you through things because it can be a little bit confusing as to where you should go so um i think you know the big thing a lot of people have initially is trying to actually shoot at something so if they can just maybe fly into beloga or something like that you know that's usually a, a good tool to at least get your gunnery um your gunnery eye in so to speak before hitting a more more um i don't know what you want to call it like maybe more involved multiplayer where you have to navigate and things like that yeah for sure and, and that's a good suggestion too is is you know and i i've got another question that i'll post to the group later about uh you know going through some of the most popular multiplayer servers but uh a server like berlogo which you know for the for someone who's new to the multiplayer scene uh berlogo is set up as a a very quick uh dogfighting uh scenario so the idea is that you spawn in and probably within 30 seconds you're already into combat so uh in terms of practicing your multiplayer combat and kind of getting used to the the combat aspect of il2 multiplayer that's a great place to just kind of try it out and uh you know even the most experienced uh amongst us and, and i think john's point to setting expectations even the most experienced players in a scenario like that are going to get shot down on a regular basis but it's a good training tool to just kind of get used to it and you know make sure that you've got your settings are, are all working properly and, and that kind of thing i don't know how many in the group have have I think most of us have, have flown together in, in Berloga. Have, has everybody tried that? I've not flown Berloga. I do, I do it pretty frequently. <laughs> I like, like a yeah, phone, I a, you know, I don't get... Yeah. Uh, I, I keep forgetting about it. And then when I do remember, I'm like, hey, we should go in Berloga. And then I end up having a pretty good time. Because even, even when you get shot down, you just kind of go, okay, well, I'll get a new plane and uh, take it up there and, uh, and fly around with it. And again, you, you get shot down in a minute or two and you just you're back into combat with a new plane and 30 seconds to a minute again. Like it's, uh, it's, it, it's not quite as, um, sort of, uh, disheartening as, you know, if you've, uh, spawned in on, on a more serious, uh, server and you're, uh, you know, you spent the time and you flew 20 minutes to target and then someone nails you out of the sun and, and you, uh, um, <laughs> and then it's kind of over and you have to go through the whole process again. Yeah, so. You're trying to create some kind of learning objective. So, if all you're doing is flying around for 20 minutes and get shot down, you're not really going to learn anything from that flight. So at least on something like Beloga, you can get some repetition in there because that's what that's what's important to help yourself learn. Yeah, exactly. And and I think uh, the other point, you know, that uh, a couple of you brought up is uh, just, uh, you know, use the offline tools as well. You know, quick mission builder, set yourself up on a on a runway just by yourself, just so you can make sure that, you know, if you're new to the sim, that your controls are good and and you know how to take off uh, and land. In, well, take off is is uh, is pretty much you know, pretty common in most of the multiplayer servers. Uh, landings are uh, uh, optional, which is the opposite of uh, of the real world. But uh, <laughs> well, you know, you always just bail out. You don't have to land. I know. I know. I know. Yeah, exactly. I know. I know L two developer when I met him. He told me that um, you know, for the first few years he flew L2 1946, he never landed. He just bailed. So he never landed in an airplane <laughs> for years. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah uh yeah so it's 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 the opposite of real world in that in that sense so um yeah but it just you know making sure i think that you've you've got you kind of your basics down your buttons work uh the trigger works the you know flaps and gear um and if you're playing on some of the servers or actually most of the servers um um, you need to make sure that you have key binds for some of the engine controls as well. So um, maybe we should get a little bit into that. What are kind of the the bare minimum controls that you think people need? Uh, and this is going to vary a little bit per plane. Um, but like take the average airplane. Well, one thing I, I started doing multiplayer maybe a year ago, for example. And the one thing I really had trouble with was taxiing. Because in every in single player in the career mode, for example, you start on the runway, engine's already running, you're ready to go, you don't have to taxi. 
but uh, in multiplayer, you generally have to taxi your aircraft to the runway. And like locking and unlocking your tail wheel, for example, uh, that, that is something that took some, <laughs> some getting used to, admittedly. Kind of <laughs> embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I crashed into a lot of other players. So, <laughs> uh, taxiing is definitely something to, to work on, I suppose. If you're not used to taxi before going into multiplayer, that, that can be a big challenge. Yeah, honestly, I think it's the hardest thing <laughs> to do in the game. Uh, I intentionally <laughs> left taxi uh, towards the end of my campaigns for that reason. It, that's your training campaigns, right? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. correct. Yeah. It's kind of weird. That's the yeah. first thing I let my students do uh, when I'm teaching them to you fly. Ha you have to learn it first when you're, when you're <laughs> really teach flying, them to right? you got to get the plane to the runway. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, like the Chinese guys who've never even driven a car before? It's like, okay, use, use your feet to steer, and they get it eventually. Interesting. Well, even then, some of these World War II planes have very strange quirks when it comes to taxiing. <laughs> like, the, the Spitfire is notorious for being a pain on the ground. Yes. These things are harder to and taxi that... in the sim. I think. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't, yeah. It's a little bit more difficult in the sim than it is in real life to taxi these airplanes. That's very interesting. I, I think, <clears throat> in terms of taxiing, I, I still think that, like... Uh, I mean, the first thing that you do in a multiplayer server is start your engine and then start to taxi. So, like, what better place to learn it than just <laughs> than just hop it in? I mean, <laughs> certainly, like, um, try to be be careful. Don't like or try not to run into other people. But um, but I would hate for somebody to like not go and try to fly in a multiplayer server because they're afraid that they're bad at taxiing. Absolutely. Like, God, what a what a buzzkill. And I don't think anybody should be afraid to go online because they don't think they're experts. Um, Absolutely. It, it definitely supports players of all skill levels. Yeah, That's and for I, sure. I, I think most most people in most servers are, you know, as long as you're not intentionally trying to crash into people um, mm -hmm. or you're, you know, like you, you stop your plane in front of someone and do something kind of... Um, you know, kind of mean spirited a little bit that way. I, I think most people are pretty understanding that there's going to be, uh, the, you know, skill level differences. And there's some people who've been playing IL-2 multiplayer. Uh, if we go back through, you know, a bunch of different versions of IL-2, that some of them have been flying IL-2 multiplayer for uh, close to 20 years in, in some cases. Uh, and then other people, it's, you know, their first outing. So, um, there's going to be huge skill gaps and, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think most people are, are understanding of that. That's my sense anyways. No, I think so too. I've run in, I don't even think I've really run into very many bad eggs no. in IL-2 multiplayer. It's a good community. Everybody's yeah. understanding. Yeah. Well, I like, I, I don't ever fly German planes cause I don't fly Hun <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I, started or i flew a, a dora earlier this week with a few of the guys on this on this podcast and i spun it around <laughs> like four or five times <laughs> before i got to the runway and i don't think i hit anybody but i almost hit like a couple people and like whatever man like it's your first time flying and um or it's if it's your first time using using that plane like whatever do your best and it'll it'll be okay um just like sort of look out and be aware of your surroundings maybe the the only thing that uh that you could do taxiing that would that would be bad is that's not like intentional is uh like not looking left and right before you go mm. um so yeah look before you cross the street yeah just be uh, aware of what's going on around you and if you do yeah. make a mistake you know a simple uh, sorry in chat goes a long way maybe exchange Absolutely. insurance yeah. information and uh that's it. <laughs> People, I mean, people, people are pretty lighthearted if you like, uh, if you're, if you're humble and sort of self mocking in, in being a bad taxier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, For sure. every, everybody's been there. You can tell the really bad taxis because they do that classic 1G comfy chair fighter pilot takeoff, which is you're at the ramp and just start the engine and boom, straight ahead and you'll take <laughs> off right across the runway as, as, as someone else is taking off. So, but yeah just hop on wings of yeah. liberty um all of their all of their uh taxiways are or they always do it at yeah, aerodromes runways are optional like runways so you can just the, yeah you just you just cowboy it just full throttle but, uh, the big thing that'll help your enjoyment in multiplayer is actually having someone to fly with like i don't personally i don't really fly multiplayer 
when I'm by myself because it's boring. You know, having someone else to at least talk to and work with, whether you, you know, get a kill or get shot down, I don't really care. It's more like being able to be able to just do some teamwork with someone, so that'll, that's a big thing. So if you're starting out, if you have someone else you know, then um, just okay. encourage you to fly with them as often as possible. Yeah, I think that's just as important as, as any solo skill you can develop is having people to fly with. And, uh, you know, it doesn't need to be the same group all the time. I think most servers out there have uh, some TeamSpeak or Discord um, official voice channel that anybody can jump in and just start coordinating with others and, and just, you know, kind of wing up. Yep. And I, I think that's a great suggestion. And I think that's we've seen a bit of a difference uh, in the last couple of years, I'd like to say. Um, most of the server communities now have a Discord uh, community that has sprung up around their server and that's kind of added I think to the the possibilities for m like more spontaneous team up uh, because you can pop into one of their uh, chat channels and say hey I'm gonna be flying in you know half hour and uh, does anyone want to join me and most of the time I I've seen people respond I'd be like yeah I'll be right on in you know 25 minutes or something I'll, or 10 minutes or whatever I'll be right on um, and I think that the 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 chat side of, of a Discord uh, uh, community really helps to get people into the video or into the uh, the voice part of the community, and that's when you you know hop on the server and you enjoy some of the you know the teamwork potential as that, that you guys have been talking about. I think it kind of reflects. I, mean, I never I never played um, 1946 online, but I always heard about hyper lobby, and I feel like you know the way discord works with the chat it's kind of and i guess it might be like that in a way guys would often Little talk bit. to each other amongst Definitely. that and then jump in a game so i mean i know that like on my discord channel when i do like a scramble thing you know we'll get people respond just to go fly so it's just a matter of actually saying something yourself to get the ball rolling rather than waiting for someone else to say something yeah don't be shy Exactly. And, and here's an opportunity. Uh, uh, Requiem didn't do it, but uh, I will uh, plug uh, Requiem has a new Discord uh, uh, server area that's been set up and uh, it's it's well suited to uh, learning and asking questions. So uh, I will make sure that there is a link posted in association with this podcast. So if you're looking to join into a, a multiplayer community and you're looking for some help to get started, uh, this is a good place to go. Yeah, I suck at self-promotion. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but uh, we've seen we've seen your discord grow uh, quite a lot in the last couple of weeks since you started it and uh, a lot of people asking questions and and teaming up and that's exactly you know those are the really sort of positive moments that i just i love to see in the community yeah joining that discord might be might be step one yeah it's very active and there's flights all the time as well like there's constantly people teaming up in there there's somebody in there right now. Exactly. Yeah. I <laughs> just checked too. That's awesome. You're going to learn so much more about IL2 once you start flying with another human being or like talking to another human being about the video game. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe people who listen to this already have like a community of friends who, who play offline. But since this episode's supposed to specifically target people who might not be online yet, I learned the entire game playing multiplayer with another friend who had never played IL2 before either. And so we learned everything we could about the planes just by like sort of breaking them <laughs> overheating <laughs> a bunch of engines and stuff together and you learn you you learn weird things like uh like we learned from talking to another person on a discord channel that uh the p39 has like an ideal um or like a a fastest uh speed at a specific radiator setting or something and that was it's just stuff that you would you'd never find it if you weren't talking to another human being yeah, otherwise this is too much trial and error. So, yeah, there's 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 tons of learning opportunities when you're when you're with uh, a group. I know, uh, you know, I've I've done a fair bit of multiplayer flying over the years, but I have to say that one of the area, areas that I was really bad at was the uh, the navigation without having some kind of uh, you know the uh, plane icon on the map. So when I started flying with uh, with the group of you, and you know when we went on some of the servers like uh, Combat Box or TAW. Um, where there is no uh, plane icon on the map, that was a that was actually fairly new for me, 
and uh, it was it was a good experience because I've learned a lot about the doing navigation um, because of of joining this group, and and that's coming from you know myself having done IL two multiplayer since you know like kind of the early two thousands, but never really kind of gotten into the the navigation side of things before. I was more focused on the combat and the flying and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, there's just there's great opportunities when you join a group that you can just learn you learn new skills that. You know, even if you're a, a more of a veteran, you you may pick up on some things that you didn't know before. I, I think it's just it's, it's a great way to learn. Oh yeah, definitely. I, and the navigation thing, I, I was in the same boat. It was one of the more Im intimidating aspects of multiplayer, not having your little plane on the map showing you where you are. <laughs> For sure. And it, it was one of the reasons I probably never. I only flew Wings of Liberty if I ever flew multiplayer, because they have it. They have the little icon. But navigation is such a, it's a pretty rewarding thing to do, honestly. Like making it back home, <laughs> you know, actually <laughs> yeah. finding your air base. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and you're going to have bad times with it too. I, you know, I, uh, I, I feel, feel like I've gotten, you know, significantly better at doing it over the last uh, few months for sure. But then I'll have the odd time where I'm looking around and looking at, at this town, I'm looking over at this river and I'm going... I think I know where I am. And then about five minutes later, I go, nope, I have no idea where I am. And uh, you just have those moments. Uh, honestly, it's a little bit easier if you're sharing it with people because at least they'll laugh at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, navigation is one of those funny things that uh, there's not really a right way or a wrong way to do it. If you know where you are, you're, that's fine. There, however you determined that, that's that works. Um, I know for myself, I, I try to pick out... Uh, large features if I'm more lost. Um, but if I have a rough idea of where I am, then I start looking for those little micro features and, and uh, little river features, small towns, cities. Um, but if you can figure out where you are and you're navigating correctly. Yeah, and there's also a flight planner website, right? Correct, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's right. That's what I used to start um, when I was first starting to play on TAW. And we, since this again since this is targeted at people who maybe haven't flown much multiplayer um they might not even be aware of this like when you fly on certain multiplayer servers you have no airplane icon on the map to indicate where, where you are so no GPS. you can That's yeah right. so you can like you pick an airbase to spawn from um out of typically out of like a, a couple like between two and you know i don't know five air bases or something and you'll pick your plane and you'll spawn and there have been times where i have picked my plane and spawned and pulled up my map and forgotten which airbase yeah. i spawned in <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> been there yeah so um so there's yeah it's it's a it's a different world from single player where you you have to like sort of go out of your way to disable that uh moving airplane icon and the way that i learned how to do navigation was i started flying taw um and i was i was really intimidated and i couldn't figure out where i was going and i went on youtube and looked up like taw navigation and uh there was a guy who just like showed how he went to the il2 mission planner website and um plotted out a course and he would like set a stopwatch so i got a stopwatch out and um <laughs> And made sure that my speed, my airspeed, was was roughly what I uh, had set it up as in the flight planner, and used a stopwatch to do it. And that's definitely um, the immersive way to do it. Too much, too much it, work. You know, well, I didn't, I didn't realize that like the map, uh, the images on the IL two maps, correspond incredibly well to the. Yeah to the images that you see in the real game. Like that's not, that's not a thing. Like you really can fly VFR just with the IL2 map. And that's not a thing that exists in the same sense in like a, a DCS or an X-Plane or many other flight simulations. Most of the maps in those games just aren't as readable as the IL2 map is. So, And that's a good point. For me, since I fly in VR, I can't rely on a second screen with a map on it. Sure. I'm not relying on any stopwatches, uh, anything outside of my in-game experience. And I really rely on the accuracy of that map. I mean, down to just a small cluster of trees uh, accurately being mm -hmm. represented. For me, I, I I don't use a stopwatch. I just do the old-fashioned pilotage. Let's look at the window. Okay, that looks like this, or this looks like that. So that's easiest for me. Yeah, and I, I think that you know uh, what John's talking about with the you know using a stopwatch is a is a fantastic uh, and very immersive way of doing it. Um, you don't have to, and and 
um, most of us don't fly that way, but you certainly can, and it works, which is which is you know sort of a fantastic part of the simulation. If you don't, if you want to kind of go that route, then you can. If you don't feel like you're kind of up to that just just yet, yeah, kind of the more of a dead reckoning approach where you just kind of go, okay, I, we're going to fly from this point to this point, and when we get there, there's a there's a town or a village or there's three rivers that uh, come together or something like that. Um, that really, that works pretty well most of the time as well. Um, just so that people don't feel like, you know, they don't have to use a stopwatch or, or something I, like that. Yeah, to be clear, I don't suggest anybody does that. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it was it's tedious. I was, I was amazed at the uh, fidelity of the flight simulation that I could plot out on a map, you know, in a web app. Uh, my course and set my predicted airspeed at each one of those points and um, and arrive at the target. But had I known that I could have just looked out the window and that the IL-2 map that they provide, like cities and trees and rivers and streams and everything and roads, like all are... Um, all are very easy to parse um, from the air at any altitude. I never would have used <laughs> that stopwatch method. That was that was because I that was because I I didn't think there was any other way to figure out where you were going. Oh, interesting, interesting. So you you came at it from that perspective first, and then you kind of mm -hmm. used the other method as well. Oh yeah, I never I I don't use a stopwatch anymore. I even built like I I built a a, a distance like timer thing with an Arduino <laughs> that has like three, three, uh, three clock displays. And I have a little dial and I can change my airspeed and it'll tell me how far I've flown. And like, I don't have to use that anymore. That's amazing. I just, <laughs> yeah. I just look at, <laughs> I just look at the map now and, uh, and I know where I am. So it's, you were there uh, yeah. with a, with a gigantic paper map on a table with a lamp <laughs> and you're measuring distances and I, plotting and, I looked up, I got a quote from a local printer to print the IL-2 maps because I thought they were, I like maps, but like, I thought yeah. they were great. And I was like, if I just print these out, then I could just plot stuff by myself. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Man. I was, yeah. Like again, this, this all happened before I had friends to fly with. And then I flew with real people and they're like, oh yeah, that town looks like whatever. I don't know. That, that looks like Cologne. And yeah, that's that's how I do it now. <laughs> that's a smart way to do it. Yeah, yeah but to your I'll, point, the game supports it. The game uh, you know, allows you to navigate in whatever way you prefer. Mm -hmm. For sure, and and I think we 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 may still have, or there is on occasion use for that if we're flying uh, high altitude over um, mm -hmm. you know some thick clouds or something like that. Uh, you know, timing your your route out might be a, a useful thing. So. Um, Again, it depends on the the sort of intensity of the multiplayer experience. Are you on something like Berlogo where there's no clouds and you're just, you know, blasting each other, or are you on something which is on the kind of the polar opposite end, uh, the TAW server where, um, yeah, there's no map icons and and it's a very sort of serious uh, experience. Um, yeah, you can kind of you can take it as seriously or unseriously as you as you want. I think is is kind of the bottom line. I was going to say maybe a nighttime level bombing run is uh, in order to try out the Arduino. Oh, dude, yeah. I, yeah, set up, set up the server. <laughs> there are almost no standard multiplayer IL-2 servers that run with any uh, level of weather that, that like has clouds obscuring the ground in a significant way. TAW does on occasion, but still almost, yeah. it's very rare that like you fly in TAW and you would need to um, do any, uh, any sort of uh, any sort of navigation that doesn't involve just looking out the window. Um, maybe this is kind of a good segue, seeing as we've been sort of skirting around this issue uh, throughout the the cast so far. Um, some of the popular multiplayer servers that we've played on. Um, maybe we can sort of provide a bit of an overview uh, together and and talk about you know which ones maybe you should. I don't know. Is there one that you know everybody should jump into first before they try another one, or you know, does it depend on the experience that you're looking for? Um, yeah, maybe we can just kind of run through some of the some of the options. So, what do you guys think? Is there a is there a single server that you know everybody who's new should should try out first, or or what do you think? I would suggest Wings of Liberty myself. It's kind of a good mix, isn't it? 
Yeah, you're going to get the uh, map icon. Um, so if you're struggling with navigation, that's going to help. The distances are fairly short, um, shorter than some of the other maps. So you can you know, fly and get shot down or crash and get right back into a plane. Uh, no taxi, as mentioned. Yeah, most of the time there's no taxiing on Wings of Liberty. I think we did the other night, but most of the time uh, there's, there's, less pretty, taxiing. there's less taxiing. Yeah. No, yeah, that's a that's a good server. I think it really just depends on what theater you want to fly in. So you have Wings of Liberty, which mostly does Eastern Front aircraft sets, and then Combat Box has more of the Western Front stuff. So yeah, that's a good point too. If if you've if you're coming from Say if you buy IL two from Steam, then you then you have to buy IL two Battle of Stalingrad first, uh, and so if you're coming from that direction, then Wings of Liberty is good because they pretty much they have Battle of Stalingrad aircraft on every single map. So mm -hmm. if that's the only title that you own, uh, you maybe you bought it during a sale or something like that. Uh, that is a good place to go because you know that they have some aircraft for you. If um, if you decided to go for Isle to Battle of Bodenplatt, and, and Wolf made a great point on this, yeah, the, kind of your the server to go to for that is is right now it's is Combat Box, um, and a couple of the other servers have uh, I think uh, Knights of the Air they do a couple of uh, uh, Bodenplatt related scenarios as well, but they're um, they do they have more of a they, yeah they have more of a mix. And uh, maybe people don't know, but you don't need to own the map in order to play on that map in multiplayer. You only need to own a plane um, that is a part of that mission. So there's some crossover um, where you could own an uh, earlier module, but be playing on a, on a different map. Yeah, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, I've been, I've been I wrote a piece on stormbirds.blog about, uh, you know, what happens if... Uh, you bought Isle 2 Battle of Stalingrad, but you do want to get in on some of these other multiplayer servers. Um, sort of the quickest and cheapest way to do that is to buy a, a collector plane that uh, that suits that scenario. So uh, for Bodenplatt, you could buy the, the D9, the FW190 D9, or the P38 uh, Lightning. Um, or a uh, popular choice, which was surprising to me uh, before I wrote the article, the BF-109 G6 collector plane, uh, which kind of slots itself nicely in almost, uh, you know, both east and west. Uh, those are all good options for someone who's just getting started. You don't want to spend a lot and you, you want to kind of have that west front experience and east front experience at the same time. That's a pretty good point. You also be a gunner too without needing to own that particular airplane either. That's a good point too. That's right. You can you can be a gunner uh, as long as you own one uh, title in the series. You can be a gunner in in anything that has a two seat option at least or more seats. So you could you could hop into a, an A twenty or a P two or um, uh, the Heinkels and the uh, Ju eighty eights have uh, lots of different uh, positions that you could uh, occupy as well. Just as you too. As, the U2, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see them as much on multiplayer, but uh, except for when we take them out in mass formations. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and and the same goes for um, and we haven't talked about it very much. But uh, Flying Circus, the same goes for Flying Circus. So uh, I know you know we uh, the group of us joined in on a Flying Circus. Uh, scenario uh, what a few months ago and some of you had it some of you didn't have it and just flying in the gunner seat was kind of enough to convince a, a few more people to to uh, buy it and and uh, get the uh, multiplayer experience for themselves but it's certainly a good way to kind of get in and and try something and uh, have a look at it without uh, committing to it yeah we sold like four copies of flying circus that that one night where we had a bunch of people or a bunch of us friends hop in as gunners like that's pretty much that just being a gunner in a world war one plane totally sells <laughs> the experience of owning that game it's, it's so much fun phenomenal yeah yeah there's something about that experience too I, I don't know if it's because it's everything is so open in the world war one aircraft or you can kind of you can turn the gun almost uh you know 360 degrees or or what it is but mm -hmm. uh there is something about that experience that uh, closer range in, slower yeah. In VR in particular, too, those aircraft oh. are absolutely stunning. Absolutely Phenomenal. amazing experience. 
Yeah, so so let's maybe take uh, a sort of a brief detour. Let's talk about Flying Circus multiplayer. So um, certainly that's available. And, and for people who uh, are new to the series, Flying Circus is the World War I side of, of uh, the IL-2 Great Battle series. Uh, currently, it it's just has a volume one, so it has 10 aircraft. Um, I think most of us are here are hoping that there's going to be uh, a volume two and, and, and many more. Um, but I think uh, multiplayer for Flying Circus really does sell that that title. That experience is is better in multiplayer than um, than single player right now. I don't know. Um, maybe you guys can can weigh in with your own thoughts on that. I think Flying Circus, like I I don't know, just World War One aerial combat is such a crazy experience uh, compared to the World War Two stuff. Everything's so close. The combat's a lot faster. Um, and like you get in these crazy fur balls and you don't have a parachute or anything. So <laughs> <laughs> unless you're German, that's but. true. That's true. <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of I ironic, isn't it? Because the aircraft are slower and, but, and that brings the, the combat into a much tighter radius where you can kind of almost see the entire fur ball. Um, uh, but the combat also is faster at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I never thought about it that way. The airplanes are slower, but the, the combat resolves a lot quicker in uh, Flying Circus. Yeah, because yep. yeah, there's, there's, there's like the quick sort of like back and forth, right? And the positioning and, and you know, were you surprised or did everybody see each other? And then who gets on whose tail? And, and uh, uh, it can be quite dramatic. It's very exciting. It's a lot of fun. And the turn rates are so um, so fast because you're flying at a slower speed like you just whip those planes around and you really feel the um i i don't know you you can like stomp on the rudder and like turn your plane almost 180 degrees in an instant it's amazing i think maybe for new players that struggle with navigation and spotting sometimes flying circus is a good option if they're interested in it because uh since the planes are flying slower uh, you have a little bit more time to navigate. Um, you're going to see planes um, at a distance that uh, you can't engage with them. So you have some time to react and time to think about the situation you're in. Oh, and in terms of navigation, Flying Circus also has the benefit of having one massive landmark going through yep. the middle of the map, <laughs> which is no man's land. As long as you know east from west, like, you'll be okay. Yeah, so I guess we should uh, mention the the one pretty popular Flying Circus server which is Yasta 5 Flug Park. They do flyouts pretty pretty often, every Thursday, Sunday, yeah, Tuesday, it... I believe. Oh, they do Tuesday as well? Yeah. It's, it's become pretty popular, so definitely recommend checking it out. And like others said, just hop into a gunner seat and see what it's like. Yeah, it, that can be a lot of fun. And, and certainly, you know, even though Flying Circus has a smaller multiplayer population, the fly-in events that... Uh, uh, happen on a regular basis, you know, two, three times a week, uh, Thursday night for sure. I know we've been on there and, uh, and Sunday afternoons. Um, those are great opportunities to get in when the servers are full. Um, and keeping in mind, those are all times in North America. Uh, so it'll be a little bit different if you're connecting from somewhere else, but, uh, um, check the forums for, uh, and I, I will post a link to in, in the description. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a great way to kind of get into a multiplayer experience. It's, uh, yeah, it's a little bit slower. And, it, and as everybody was saying, it gives you a chance to, to navigate and to, to see your opponents before they, um, before they come and uh, try and shoot you down. Or, or you might shoot them down. You never know. So I see, I see Requiem has posted a, uh, um, some information on uh, the turn rate, turn performance of the camel. I don't know, do you want to say something about that or, or just kind of about those planes? Um, if you look at the peak of the camel, it's like 80 degrees per second. Well, this is all preliminary stuff, but even on a World War II airplane, you know, the peak's going to be like 30 degrees a second. So the camel, you know, for example, can really whip it around really quickly with a you know, turn radius of like 100 feet. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> it's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah, and it, it just changes the way that the combat happens. I don't know. I think it's it's it can be very accessible for a new player. Yeah, it's like yeah, the World War One stuff. You'll fly around nice and slow, so it'll give you time to think about how you want to approach a fight. And then once you're in it, it's mm -hmm. just balls to the wall, hair on fire. 
go nuts. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's just as, as you go faster and faster, the BFM slows down. That's why World War Two is kind of a, a sweet spot to to experience it. Yeah, it is, and 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 the World War Two experience will change as well. If you get into early war uh, air combat versus the late war air combat, there there is. It's, uh, I don't know if you guys think it's subtle or not. I think it, it's a little bit subtle, but you know, there's a, there's a difference between um, certainly say something like an I-16 or even an early BF-109 and, uh, and the experience you get if you're fighting with Mustangs and uh, Tempests and um, BF-109 uh, K models where uh, this, the speed is just uh, uh, so much higher. Uh, it definitely changes the air combat experience. I, I have the sense that the late war uh, air combat can be a little more challenging from kind of a spotting and um, engagement point of view because you you see your enemies less for less time, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, closing rates are higher. Well, but yeah, well, the spotting's another whole issue, so I won't go into that one. <laughs> yeah, we, that could be a whole other episode, so... Uh... <laughs> but that's what reshade is for, so... That's true. So, and again, for people who don't know, um, one of uh, there is a popular utility out there called Reshade, which uh, you know you can use that to. I mean, I think what most of, most people seem to be doing is uh, increasing the contrast a little bit, which makes contacts stand out. Is that what uh, people have been doing? Yeah, it's when I've been um, messing around with it a little bit, and you don't really notice it when you're flying without it. Um, but once you put it on, it's kind of like you know, say like you're wearing a pair of glasses that are really smudgy. And then you wipe the glasses clean. That's kind of what Reshay kind of does. It doesn't. It doesn't fix the you know, fundamental issue with, with spotting, but um, it definitely makes things look a lot cleaner in general. Uh, on my on my next live stream, I might because um, I've I've got the keybind sorted out, so I can turn it on and off. I'll be able to show at least the difference. Say, hey, okay, this is what it looks like with it on, and then turn it off, and then you're like, whoa, okay, it's a big difference. So. All right. Anything else anyone wants to kind of say on uh, on IL2 multiplayer servers? I guess we didn't really quite go through the list. I mean, there's there's Berloga, which is a dogfight server. There's um, Combat Box, which is bottom plat. There's Knights of the Air, which kind of does a little bit of everything. Uh, they're even doing some tank crew stuff now. Um, the Unprofessionals? Oh, yes, of course, the Unprofessionals, uh, which is an Australian-based uh, server, and uh, they've just uh, done some upgrades to that, and I think that's mm -hmm. uh, becoming more popular. And uh, they have AI stuff running around, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. If the, I think it, it's set up so if the server is empty, then there's more AI. So even if it looks like there's... Uh, there's nobody there. You can kind of join in. The AI kind of serves as a good substitute until more people join, and then the AI kind of fall away. I think that's that's a smart way to kind of handle a, a smaller uh, multiplayer community. But I, 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 my understanding is that it is growing uh, quickly. Yeah, that's a that's a good way, good place to practice as well. So you you have AI pilots you can shoot up, but you also have the threat of actual players shooting you <laughs> for so sure you, for you sure. play a little you play a little differently i guess flying against people is completely different to flying against ai yeah for sure and i and i think yeah flying against uh, people for the first time is going to be an interesting experience for for anyone who's only done offline flying uh human pilots are not nearly as predictable um as the ai pilots and it kind of works both ways too because you could have somebody who's quite new uh, as your opponent or someone who's a seasoned veteran and you're going to see uh, all kinds of different uh, uh, different you know flying styles or, or different tactics or uh, strategies employed when you're when you're flying against a human it it's, can be it's very exciting it's it can be you know it can get the heart rate going even yeah and to the point where you know something especially when you're starting out is to focus on not um, gripping the stick really hard because you'll feel like you're flying with a light touch and then as soon as you get into you know the combat with someone you start gripping it really tight and then you start inducing the oscillations to kind of throw the airplane around a little bit too much so just got to try and maintain that you know, that calm calm nature and uh easy easy movements with the stick that's a great suggestion D does anyone else have any uh suggestions about um you know do they do something before they like i i've for a long time now, I've kind of I've done that kind of thing where I'm like, okay, I'm getting into uh, air combat sequence with a with a human, which always kind of, I don't know, it it's more intense certainly, um, and 
I have for a long time kind of practiced uh, just like take a moment and kind of go, okay, breathe. All right, I'm going to do this. Uh, and that, that I find helps me kind of lighten up on the grip and I can be more precise that way. Does anyone else have any strategies that they employ? I've tried to start thinking about the situation a bit more, like analyzing my advantages and their disadvantages or vice versa. I, I find that helps. And I try to keep like my altitude advantage a bit more when I'm actually thinking about it <laughs> instead of just, you know, <laughs> going in for the kill, uh, immediately. Um, uh, it increases my survival rate as well. <laughs> For sure. And that, that is kind of the thing. It's like the first time you spot somebody online, you're like, oh, there they are. We're going to go and get them. We're going to get them right now. Like, don't even wait. We're going to go get them. But I think, yeah, waiting a little bit can, can be uh, helpful. Uh, uh, you know, Pioneer, I don't know, because I think you're the newest to multiplayer. Um, maybe you kind of haven't gone through as much of that. But, I mean, what's your what's your kind of... You know, have you kind of done things differently in the last couple of months since you started, uh, you know, versus, say, your first flight? Yeah, I think maybe just recognizing that uh, the same tricks and, and stuff that I'd use to take down AI in single player or in uh, cooperative games um, is not necessarily going to work on multiplayer. Um, sound flying is still sound flying, but um, you're, you know, working against uh, thinking humans uh, rather than AI that are going to kind of follow a more predictable pattern of behavior. That's where repetition is key as well. You know, the more repetition, the more, Always. the more times you put yourselves in, in a situation, um, it can allow you to not worry so much about, you know, if you're already comfortable flying the airplane, then you don't worry. You don't have to worry about flying the airplane so much. It's more about, okay, what is the other guy doing and where is he relative to me and what do I need to do to put him where I want to put him. So I mean, that's that's all I'm really thinking about. I don't really care if I die so much. I'm just like, I don't, I'd rather kill the guy. <laughs> I'd rather kill the guy. I don't care if I get killed by someone else <laughs> two seconds later. But um, it's kind of just focusing on that, focusing on that one, that one target initially and see how you go and just see how that you can kind of tell how the performance goes relative to you. And if you're going to have to either continue pressing on him or, you know, extend and try and leave and get someone else to shoot him. Okay, so um, maybe we can kind of wrap this up with maybe some quick uh, do's and don'ts when you get into a multiplayer server. Um, uh, I, I know we've already kind of touched on this a little bit. So, you know, when you when you you join in, I always think, you know, if you're going on a multiplayer server for the first time, I think it's a good idea to very quickly have a look at the briefing, especially if they have a, a rule section. And then, you know, most multiplayer servers have similar rule sets, but... Um, you know, some of them will encourage um, some things and, and some of them will discourage the same same thing. Uh, a common one is, is uh, something called vulching, which uh, is kind of a community term uh, that's been used for quite a long time now. But it's uh, basically it's the act of strafing other players at, uh, at the, the enemy airbase. Some servers encourage that. Um, and other servers discourage that. So that's always a good one to look out for on the list. Are there, are there some other things that are kind of do's and don'ts uh, for everybody? Don't don't press Alt F4 when someone tells you to, if you ask how to start your engine. <laughs> yes. That, that just goes back to know your key binds. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, uh, people don't take kindly to... Uh, when you shoot their parachutes don't do that oh yeah that's true uh don't shoot your friends be yes. be sure uh you're shooting at the enemy yeah so know what a, know what a p40 looks like if you fly an allied okay. yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right and that's a good one i mean i mean that is a um, uh, an issue in the, in, the, in the simulation as well as an issue in in uh, certainly in the history books uh, where uh, allied uh, fighters clashed with each other and seemingly hadn't identified each other. But yeah, that's always a good thing if you're playing on a server that doesn't have icons, which is most of them. Um, yeah, it's always a good idea to kind of do a double check. And I mean, I I've, I've been guilty of this. I'm sure many of you have been guilty of it too. Of of I don't know. You kind of you look at a plane, but maybe you saw something before, and it kind of sticks in your head. So you just uh, you focus in on on your gunnery, and you don't think about ah, I should just double check. Is that actually you know 
is that the bad guys or is that the good guys? Is, should I be shooting at this one or not? It's always a good thing to just double check, you know, ask that question to yourself. Yeah, and the more you fly, the more you'll learn the silhouettes of every aircraft and it won't be as big of an issue. Exactly. Team chat's a good one. Uh, making sure you're not giving away your position or somebody else's position to the enemy team. So making sure you're uh, making use of team chat. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, navigation lights too, or or landing lights. Those uh, in IL two right now, it can be spotted from uh, a very long way away. <laughs> yeah, well, it shouldn't be, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it, yeah. everyone uses identifying marks. So I mean, generally, if you're going to come into land, you know, throw your nav lights on, throw your throw your landing light on. That way, people are generally aware of your intentions if that's what you're going to be doing. So okay, um, well, I think uh, that's probably a as good a spot as uh, any to uh, wrap up uh, episode one. Uh, does anyone uh, have anything that they want to add before we uh, before we wrap it up? Let's go fly. Yeah, come fly, come fly, jump into multiplayer. You know, if if um, uh, your internet connection supports uh, multiplayer, um, um, you know, games, um, give IL two multiplayer a shot. It's uh, it, you know, it looks intimidating, but, uh, you know, with a little bit of help from, uh, say, uh, you know, uh, Requiem's uh, new Discord or from any of the multiplayer communities that are out there, uh, you know, you can, uh, I think you can get, most people can get up to speed pretty quickly and, uh, and start, you know, getting in there and having some fun. Oh, yeah. It's a great opportunity to get out your get out of your comfort zone. What, like, yeah. Another thing, a lot of people are approachable, too. So, you know, if you don't want to fly by yourself, all you'd have to do is ask if you can fly with someone. And I'm sure I'm sure there'll be someone out there who'll volunteer. So. Absolutely. All right. Uh, any more final thoughts? We mentioned TAW by acronym a lot. I don't know that we ever actually elaborated on what the server is. That's a good point. Maybe we should, uh, John, do you want to do the honors and just uh, kind of sure. very quickly talk about TAW? Because that's actually, yeah, maybe that's a good way to end. I mean, that's a unique multiplayer experience, kind of uh, not for the, I wouldn't say it's it's not a good server for the newbie, but uh, it's, a, it's a very engrossing multiplayer experience after you've kind of gotten, you know, your uh, kind of feet under you in multiplayer. Yeah, TAW, uh, it's a, it's called tactical air war. Um, it is, I don't know. I think it's kind of like the, the pinnacle of IL two realistic multiplayer or any aspect of IL two that, that attempts to be realistic. It's a dynamic campaign that takes place sometimes over weeks, sometimes over months. Um, they have a website where you go and, um, create a user ID and they will then on the website assign you uh, planes that you can use and based on your performance in each sortie you will get points or lose points um, you lose points if you do things like dying or trashing your planes um, and you will be awarded extra extra planes or you will run out of planes and run out of virtual pilot lives um, the server runs for two hours at a time for like, uh, I don't know what they call them. They might call them missions. They, they have maps and missions and they're like on their, on their Eastern campaign right now, I think there's like seven maps maybe. And, um, and they run these two hour missions. And then at the end of a two hour mission, uh, their server backend, uh, simulation runs and assesses who did damage to what areas and repopulates the map and, and throws it back up online again and uh you can sort of watch the whole war progress and participate in it and uh there's a strategic level to the play that i don't think really exists in most other il2 servers at the moment um most servers can have a lot of uh tactics as sort of like their highest level of play but uh in when you hop on taw you you might decide that flying air cover over um over like a, a truck convoy is like the way that you can best support your team <laughs> in the long run um or in the short run and uh as opposed to like going and and bombing a target or something so it's it's pretty neat yeah it's a it's a really interesting experience and i think because the pilots and the aircraft are limited it changes the way people fly so 
Um, you know, in, in other multiplayer servers, and this is certainly a good thing if you're a new player, in, in most multiplayer servers, either the aircraft are unlimited or, you know, there's 20 or 30 types available or something like that at a, um, a given base for the duration of that scenario. In TAW, it's a very individual uh, list of aircraft that are available. So, um, you know, if you run out of a certain type, then you're going to have to uh, do what they call combat missions to get uh, your aircraft supply replenished. So you fight a lot harder to save your aircraft, uh, certainly to save your pilot, try and get across enemy lines if you're in trouble before you bail out, that kind of thing. It, it, it changes the whole multiplayer experience. It makes it sort of that much more um, serious. And, and so I think that's the reason why you know, it's maybe not the best for a uh, a brand new player, but once you've started to get in and, you know, if you're feeling like, well, I want something that's a little more sort of uh, engrossing or serious, then, then TAW can really uh, offer that, that layer that the other servers uh, don't cater to. It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting experience. So I guess uh, one, la one last thing I want to say, uh... Is there a, a certain festival or anything that's happening in about a week <laughs> where people could join and play multiplayer? <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. So, so yes. Uh, so for the ending preamble, um, um, there is. Uh, I announced that uh, just over a week ago, uh, Sturmovik Fest is the hopefully first annual Sturmovik Fest. Uh, is a uh, not entirely multiplayer uh, event, but certainly a multiplayer-oriented event. Uh, it will have a series of um, multiplayer uh, fly-ins on different servers that will be part of a schedule. Uh, each of those multiplayer servers, their Discord or, or TeamSpeak uh, communities will be uh, advertised along with uh, the fly-in event for each day. It's going to be happening uh, April 26th to May 3rd. So. Um, yeah, it's a great time to uh, come in and, and join in the multiplayer experience. I know a bunch of people have uh, talked to me and said that, you know, they hadn't done multiplayer, but uh, they were going to uh, get involved with the, the festival uh, that was going to convince them to give it a shot and see what it's like. So, um, yeah, thanks for that, Wolf. No, no problem. I think it's a fantastic uh, idea, as, long, as well as this podcast. So thanks for having us on. Yeah, well, yeah. Thank you, everybody. everybody, for joining in. Uh, appreciate it. So uh, that concludes episode one. Thank you very much, and uh, hope to see you again. Have a good one.